So I'll man the chat and uh, Mark will pop any questions over to you. Thank you very much. Okay. Nicola will join us at five o'clock. So I think we're pretty much on time then. So uh, hi folks, welcome to this Sira Connect session. I'm really grateful to be uh, welcomed here on behalf of the Scottish Council of Deans of Education, uh, Scottish Attainment Challenge Research Project. So that uh, will be one of a number of sessions we're gonna be having over the oncoming months. So uh, hopefully we'll see you again after today. And thanks ever so much for sparing a bit of your time to join us. Um, as with usual with the Sierra Connects, just to remind you that uh, it is a recorded session. So if you do want to hide away from us, then uh, feel free to turn your camera off. And um, just to avoid background noises disturbing the presentations and our discussion, uh, if you'd leave yourselves on mute, uh, unless we're turning to a point of discussion and you'd like to join in, then we'd be really grateful if you wouldn't mind doing that. There is a link on this front slide here to the Scottish Council Deans of Education website where you can find a bit more information about this research project. So do please feel free to take a look at that. And uh, you can see the logos here at the bottom right of the, the three universities who are involved in the presentation that you've got on this, this seminar discussion this afternoon in terms of the University of the West of Scotland, the University of Dundee, and the University of the Highlands and Islands. So uh, thanks for coming along to join us. Just in terms of a little bit of background of where this all comes from, um, the Scottish Government's funded this Attainment Challenge project, and you can actually find the interim reports that have been carried out so far on the National Improvement Framework website, National Improvement Hub website. There are 10 projects underway at the moment, and there are across eight universities that are taking part in this. So Aberdeen, Dundee, Edinburgh, Glasgow, Stirling, Strathclyde, the University of the Highlands and Islands, and the University of West, the West of Scotland are, are all involved. My name is Mark Lindley Highfield, and I'm at uh, the University of the Highlands and Islands based in Inverness. And uh, I'll be trying to chair the session this evening or this afternoon. And I'm joined for the presentation and discussion parts of this by Dr. Stephen Day from the University of the West of Scotland, and Professor Jim Scott and Derek Robertson from the University of Dundee, who uh, we're really grateful to have along with us for the session this afternoon. So just to echo once again, a huge thank you to you for you sparing a bit of your time to come and join us. And in, in addition to that, we'd like to thank CIRA itself for enabling these, uh, this short series from the Scottish Council of Deans of Education Research Project to be hosted as part of the CIRA Connect events. So big thank you to you for that. So this is the first in that series. And um, do watch out for announcements upon the CIRA website of the Spring Fling series that's taking place. These events are just a small part of that. There's, there's lots of other stuff to look out for too, including something as soon as next week. So uh, do, do take a peek at the website to see what's available. Just to give you an idea of the format for the session, we're going to have two presentations, one from each of the university groups. You'll hear first of all from Dr. Stephen Day at the University of West of Scotland. And uh, after that session, we'll have a little bit of time for some focus questions specific to that presentation. And then we'll hear from the University of Dundee's team on, on their research with an opportunity for a couple of questions on that. And then we'll open up into a wider discussion to address the themes that are brought up by this session. I have to say for me, it's been really interesting and exciting to be one part of the, the wider project, but also to be witness to the presentations you're gonna to hear tonight. I think they're really on the ball as to some current issues we're grappling with in, in teacher education particularly. And um, there certainly are, are interesting expressions of those. So as I say, I hope you enjoy it as much as, as I've done. Do feel free to use the chat function to just jot down your questions as you think of them. They will be collated and they'll, as I say, we'll, we'll come to address them at appropriate points later on. So in terms of uh, us beginning then, we're gonna begin with Stephen Day from the University of the West of Scotland. Stephen's head of the Division of Education at that university, and his research focuses on secondary and primary science education and the development of higher education students' criticality. He's also interested in aspects of leadership, so leadership practices and teacher leadership too. So without much more of a fuss, I will let Stephen come in and to talk to his topic of developing final ITE student teachers' data literacy and their ability to use classroom level data. Thanks, Stephen. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to 
first of all begin by um, just introducing some of the ideas around about data literacy and some of the policies that have been going on in the last wee while. So over the last 20 years, I think it's fair to suggest that educational policy across Europe has shifted towards a more increased focus on datafication in education, which espouses the virtue of data-informed decision-making in schools. Now, this has resulted in increased political pressure on national education systems to account for perceived deficiencies in pupil outcomes and has led to calls for teachers to engage much more deeply with educational data as part of their decision-making processes. However, in the National uh, Improvement Framework for Scotland, it actually calls on teachers to engage with data-informed decision-making, but it does so without really taking into account the, uh, you know, some of the issues, and it pays very little attention to the fact that we don't really know that much about the current level of data literacy within the profession at this time. But equally, they've not really thought about the level of data literacy that is required to critically engage with educational data in order to be able to make sense of that data in, in terms of decision-making at the leadership level and at the classroom level. But also, we've not really taken into account to what extent does initial teacher education and the induction scheme focus on student teachers' data literacy as part of their curricula. So, when we think about the international research on um, data-driven uh, decision-making, I think it's fair to suggest that some of the research indicates that teachers feel threatened by the concept and underprepared to engage in data-driven decision-making processes. Also, the evidence seems to suggest that many teachers don't systematically use database judgments, or if they do, they only tend to trust the data that confirms their intuition rather than using data to shape their professional judgments. Now, these findings tend to indicate that many in-service teachers possibly lack the skill, the motivation, or the positive attitude towards the use of data to support the professional judgments. But what is less well known within the literature is how pre-service teachers are prepared to use the wide range of data that is available to them, and also what factors affect the data that they can use as part of their professional judgments. Now, it's fair to also suggest that teachers' attitudes and belief towards the use of data is complex. And in fact, attitude is a complex construct which has got multiple dimensions which require discrete evaluation in order to get a better understanding of what that attitude is, since the different dimensions contribute in varying degrees to the overall object of attitude, which in this case is the use of data. So our research was trying to focus on exploring the dimensions related to um, attitude, particularly relating to cognitive belief, affective state, perceived affective control, and perceived control uh, using a construct based around about Albert Bandura's work. But it also focused on the extent to which final year ITE students can actually analyze, interpret, and reflect on educationally relevant data. And in this case, we used classroom level tracking and monitoring data. So let's think about what, what did we find? What is their attitude? Well, I think it's fair to suggest that we found quite a mixed bag. The, when we looked at each of the different subscales, this table will show you the data that shows that we can actually shift attitude from pre post in PGDE secondary, PGDE primary, and BE undergraduate students. Now, the data is, is quite complex, but when we analyze it, what we find is that for PGDE primary students, there's a significant increase over time in their self efficacy. And for BA4 students, there was a significant increase in their anxiety, which is something I'd like to you know, delve into further. There's also an increase in the context dependency for PGDE secondary and primary students, but a non-significant increase in the context dependency for the BA4s. And we think that that's just an artifact of the fact that we need more numbers in order to actually get that over the, the line in terms of statistical significance. 
Interestingly enough, though, we found that there was a significant decrease in the difficulty scale for the PGDE secondary students, with a significant increase in the difficulty scale for BA4 students. So there's something interesting going on in terms of their students' attitude and understanding of the level of difficulty, and that both the BA students had a significant increase in the intention to use data and the scale that looked at data effectiveness for pedagogy pre versus post, which was quite interesting. So when we tried to take all this together, we, were, we then went on and looked at a correlational analysis. And this is just an example of the correlational analysis that we had. So in this context, we're looking at context dependency versus self-efficacy. And panel A is PGDE secondary, panel B is PGDE primary, and panel C is BA4. And it's interesting to note that we actually split the, 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 the graphs up into quadrants. We have got quadrant one, which is high potential. And this is the area of the, the graph that we really want to see student teachers in post. And quadrant two is what we would suggest is promising. Quadrant three is reluctant and quadrant four is indifferent. And one of the things that we notice is that there, there are shifts between each of these quadrants as we go along. And the, the proportion of students at the post level has shifted slightly from being promising to being um, to being high potential. And there's been some shift as well from the being indifferent to being promising. But the analysis requires a little bit more modeling. I, I, I think it's fair to say. So what do we find when we actually ask students questions that relate to their ability to analyze, interpret, and make meaning from educationally relevant data? So what we did was we gave um, our PGDE primary, our PGDE secondary, and our BA4 students this set of tracking and monitoring data, which equates to uh, a, an S1 or a P4 end of topic test series, which is summative assessment. And we asked them these questions. So the questions were, what information does the data provide regarding the class's attainment? And they had to explain their answer. What topics does the class understand best? What topics do this, does the class understand least? Um, who's the highest attainer in the class, the lowest attainer in the class? And if this was your class, what does this data tell you about the pupil's attainment? And what does it tell you about your teaching? What we found was pretty interesting because universally, when we scored these, we actually had a, a, a sample size of 136 secondary, 95 primary, and 51 BA4s. And it's quite clear that there's no significant difference between the primary and the secondary PGDEs. But when you compare the primary PGDEs to the BA4 undergraduates, there's a significant difference in the ability. And when you compare the secondary to the undergraduate primary, there's a significant difference. So what I would like to then do is then go in, I've got a matrix analysis of every response to every question from all the students. And I would like to go in and do a much deeper analysis into where were they going wrong? As a quick broad sweep, one of the things that I can say is that a lot of them have difficulty, all of the students seem to have difficulty understanding some very basic numeracy concepts, such as standard deviation. <laughs> And what does that mean relative to the average for a, for a class? So what does this all suggest? Well, one of the things that we would like to suggest is that, that this shows that student attitudes towards the use of data can shift, but that that shift is actually program dependent and that the correlational analysis tends to suggest that um, context dependency is significantly correlated with self-efficacy and that context dependency is actually uh, an important element towards ITE students' attitude towards the use of data. 
So context dependency actually summarizes attitudes around about the following items, such as the availability of data handling tools, the, the, the ready availability of packages of materials to help support data informed decision making, but more importantly, the support of colleagues in school to use data. And that's been seen as being quite an important element as to why they would want to, or want, I mean, not to engage with um, data. It's fair to suggest that when we looked at the enjoyment um, element of the, the, the attitudes, none of the students enjoyed it. They really found it quite difficult. They, they didn't like it. So in all the students' groups, the level of enjoyment was low and that that impacted upon their effective fate domain of their attitude quite significantly. Although student teachers' attitude towards educational data use can shift towards promising and high potential, but actually we're starting to see that there's, there's some issues here about th their ability to use that data. Some other interesting findings. For the PGDE secondary group, 58% of that group have a STEM background. But what we found was that STEM background did not significantly improve attitude towards the use of data and that it didn't make or didn't support them to be better at handling data, which actually seems counterintuitive, but there are some issues around about context and context dependency that when you take that into account, you'll recognize that perhaps a STEM background doesn't help you to be any better at analyzing educationally relevant data. And importantly, that BA4 students were much poorer at making meaning from the educational data compared to PGDE primary and secondary. So what does this mean? What are the emerging questions for research? Well, what can initial teacher education do to better support students developing data literacy. I think that's really an important thing because we have a locus in this. To what extent do formal school experiences impact on early career teachers developing um, data literacy? But also to what extent should data literacy feature in teacher induction schemes at, in order to be able to better support early career teachers to develop their understanding of how best to use data informed decision making within their reflections? I think these are key emerging and um, themes to come out. And that's me. That's great, Stephen. Thanks ever so much for your presentation there. And as I said beforehand, both a very interesting uh, summary of the situation of your research and, and also many interesting questions raised by it as well. Um, speaking of which, I see we have a question already in the chat. I've just spotted that. So um, maybe we could turn to that first, but it might be a question that we want to come back to as well after hearing the Dundee presentation. But um, Paul Adams was asking, at what point in the career should teachers begin to engage with data? So just thinking of uh, your, your final comments there, Stephen, about some mm. of the, the, the scenarios in which it can be addressed. Do you have any sort of instinct as to where this should be developed? Well, I, I think that it, it should begin to be developed in um, initial teacher education because if you think about it, I'm actually more interested in a wider understanding of data. You know, formative assessment, for example, is something we expect them to reflect on in order to be able to evaluate their ability to engage with their developing pedagogy. If they can't use formative assessment data and the data that that gives them effectively, then we can't then expect the, the, the reflections on practice to help improve their practice. So there, there is an element of data literacy that it, it takes us beyond looking at just summative assessment data. We need to look at observational data, formative assessment data, um, and, and bringing these together more holistically, but also not taking a weather eye off of some of the, the, the difficult things that hard assessment data will actually allow them to understand. Because let's face it, they are going to go into a situation in their, their, their um, induction year where they're going to have to sit in front of parents and discuss quite openly what they think is happening with children. So if they don't know what their data is telling them about their children, then we're doing them a disservice. We're putting them in a situation where when they go out into the induction scheme, 
they, they, they're, they're lacking a, a really important skill. So I think initial teacher education is a good place to begin, but we need to recognise that that needs to be nurtured and developed. And it's not just a one size fits all. We'll have to develop that over time. I think that's a helpful response. And uh, another question's come through, which you know, highlights the significance of what you're saying. And probably I think it's one to return to later on after the Dundee presentation, but just asking, you know, is it the case that our school curriculum is light on statistical literacy? So even actually leading into the situation that you've just described, Stephen. Mm -hmm. um, we've, we've got another question here saying, um, is there a discussion to be had about what counts as data? So thinking of the task using test scores and how that fits in with the exam driven model, you know, in terms of attainment data. Um, but what about other forms of data like observational data and reports from the pupils themselves um, that crops up in activities like moderation activities? I'm just wondering, you know, did your study here involve that sort of qualitative data as well? No. Uh, what we asked them to do was something slightly different about how we gave them professional scenarios that they had to then describe how they would engage with a professional scenario um, that allowed them to draw in wider um, data. Because one of, the, one of the key things that we have to accept, particularly with the national standardised assessments, is that if they can't engage with that kind of, that kind of hard data, then what they then get themselves into a position of is basically being argued in circles around it, but, but, but your data says this. If you don't know what your data says, then how are you meant to defend yourself if someone decides to take a, 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 a sticky view of the quality of that data? So there, there's an element of that, but we do need to really be careful that we don't get sucked into looking at assessment literacy rather than looking at the full gannet of observational informative assessment, all that kind of, the, what they would argue is the softer data, because the softer data brings the context and it allows you to, to, to you know, fine grain your, 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 your reflections and your discussions with PTs, with parents, with inspectors. So they need to, students really need to understand that. Just one final question then before we move on to the Dundee presentation. So thinking about the sort of process you've gone through here, um, ex exposing them to the data and giving them a chance to work with the same. Within that process, were they engaging with each other collaboratively around the data? Or was it kind of an individual task? And was there the opportunity no. for them to sort of exercise the higher order thinking skills in, in terms of trying to explain the process to each other? No, this, this was uh, an individual task that was given to them over a week. So they were given it out. They were then asked to spend some time reflecting on it and filling it in. And then they had to then post their response and the responses to the professional um, scenarios onto the Moodle site. And then we just, we pulled that from there. Um, that's not to say that the students couldn't have, if they wanted to discuss it amongst themselves, we, we, we deliberately didn't limit them that way, um, but, I think there's good evidence because there's very little overlap between different um, interpretations that they didn't really, you know, collaborate that much, which is an element of reflection that I, I think is missing from that level of the research. I think we'd given them that as a collaborative um, exercise where they had to discuss and debate that, then we could have seen much more um, flourishing of their understanding. That's great. So uh, we've already got some ideas for taking things forward and that's, that's fab to hear. So we're going to move on in just a second to the Dundee presentation. So uh, we've got from Dundee, Professor Jim Scott. Um, one thing I learn about uh, introducing Derek and Jim is that Dundee itself has magnetic properties. You just can't escape the place. So uh, Jim's early formative degree years were, were at Dundee and um, after 19 years as a head teacher in schools, um, he found retirement in the end, but that even took him back to Dundee to do his doctoral research. Um, and then uh, going from retirement back to work for the University of Dundee, he has actually retired just a year ago, but is here today. So uh, I think also some misunderstanding of the concept of retirement might be in place there with Jim, but we're really grateful to have him here today. And with him's Derek. So Derek's uh, had a background in primary teaching before becoming an ICT staff tutor in a council education department and then himself was at Dundee 
But he similarly escaped, but uh, not for too long. After working for learning and teaching in Scotland for a while, looking at emerging technologies and learning, he came back as a lecturer and now heads the undergraduate studies within the School of Education and Social Work. Um, his research interests uh, tend to stem into, I think, Jim's speaking supported by Derek, and their focus is on improving equity and attainment through the development of research, evaluative and reflective skills in early career teachers. So uh, over to you two, thanks. Okay, thanks very much, Mark. Um, we're gonna run through fairly quickly, but I was relieved to see in Stephen's presentation that seven minutes is slightly elastic. So uh, I feel much better about that now. Um, but to a large extent, this presentation follows on quite directly from what Stephen was talking about, because we're going to look at some of the implementation of the things that Stephen was talking about with early career teacher students and with later postgraduate career students. And in slide two, um, we'll have a little look at the background of that. Um, as it shows, we really started out to be a project about ECT students, and, and we have grown both upwards into later postgraduate students and downwards into ITE students. The, the study itself set out to analyze the, the extent to which students' knowledge developed and their understanding grew, and they would use more sophisticated and more nuanced uh, ways of employing both data analysis and a, and a variety of research techniques to try to identify the root causes of learning issues within the schools or their individual classrooms, depending on their stage. Um, it's interesting, as, as we'll see in the data in a minute or two, it's interesting to see how that worked out. Some other themes emerged from the early data as well, including the extent to which students' findings on societal or catchment issues affecting their classroom actually affected their choice of intervention. And again, there were echoes in what Stephen said there. Whether societal factors or classroom factors predominated in their choice of an intervention, <clears throat> or whether, <clears throat> excuse me, or whether other factors such as school hierarchy <clears throat> had an effect on them. And finally, one of the things that we tried to track most closely was whether or not some individual aspects of the curriculum were underrepresented or overrepresented in the process of intervening to improve learning. In slide three, um, we can see that we actually had a look at a range of data sets. Um, we followed up approximately 70 students and they were split up more or less half and half in ECT students and later postgrads. And I'm not gonna read through the uh, the sets of data there that we looked at, you can see those for yourself. But I, I, I note as we pass by that, that we actually enhanced a whole range of courses. We deliberately enhanced our ECT courses. We built a new course specifically to address this. We enhanced our PGT courses and we eventually enhanced our ITE courses. So we did quite a lot of work to try and improve what they did with data, what they did with a variety of research skills and how they integrated their findings from these various things to more effectively support the children in their class. Moving on to slide four, <clears throat> if my voice holds, I should have brought a glass of water with me. If I start to croak, Derek can no doubt take over. Yes. Um, the 70 students we looked at really came in a, in a set of people who looked quite differently at how issues within their classroom took place. And if we move on to slide five, this matrix gives us a first look at what's going on. It's deliberately quite a high level matrix. We have layers of data that go all the way down, but we decided to show you the simple pattern at the top that illustrates the points that, that Derek and I are making. You can see there, if you look in the second and third columns, here are the societal and catchment issues identified by ECTs and later postgraduate students, then the learning and teaching issues within their own classroom, and then the interventions they, they decided to take. And if you sort of imagine this as in nine equal zones, you can see that the diagonal that runs from top left to bottom right is very much where the, the weight of interest or action takes place. A great deal of examination of, of analysis of societal factors is in the top left. The learning and teaching issues are broadly in the middle and the interventions carried out 
tend to be towards the, the lower end of the right hand side. And that's quite intriguing for us. Um, we suspected that there would be variation between the ECTs and the PGs. We expected that there would be a more nuanced view of what the issues were from the later postgraduates because they have a greater life experience and a greater professional experience. I'm not sure that we expected entirely that what we would find about the interventions was quite starkly different from the other two. Let's move on to slide six and, and just pause for a second before we jump into the, the, the stuff. From slide six onwards, we're going to look at the table in greater detail. We're now going to examine those three areas that we talked about, except I'll take them in broad horizontal strips, the top, the middle, and the bottom. And we hold a range of other sets of data as well beyond these. So we have um, specific data about the effectiveness of students' use of research techniques and, and data techniques. We have a, a very clear picture of the external influences. External is a bad word because it may actually be an internal influence. One of the, the greatest non-student or non-tutor influences on students was their head teacher's view of what was going on and what they should do. Uh, but we'll come back to look at those uh, in a minute or two. We have data on the extent to which teachers actually took all the relevant factors that they had uncovered and welded them into an effective diagnosis of the intervention that we needed to carry out. And then, of course, we have our own analysis of what the students did. And because we spent a fair amount of time talking with our colleagues, we have an analysis of what the tutors did with the students as well. Let's move on to slide seven. This is the top of the table. And here you can see in, in column two that altogether 93% of the early career teacher students identified poverty, multiple deprivation, social inequity of various forms, and the need to close the gap as the key factors that affected learning in their school or classroom coming in from the catchment that the school served. You see that postgraduate students are somewhat different. Uh, poverty takes a much, much lesser um, role in how they see the situation. 52% has disappeared from there. Multiple deprivation about the same. The need to close the gap may reflect the fact that there was a greater portion of secondary students in the PGT set than primary students. Digital learning appeared with the PGs and specific needs and support issues appeared as well. If I move over into the classroom, only 9% of the classroom issues fall into this domain. Now, it may be that they do not see a connection between the catchment issues and the learning and teaching issues in the classroom, but it may perhaps much more likely be that they have decided to do some things that we'll see further down to try and address the things that are in the top left-hand corner. However, in both columns, only 9% of the learning or teaching issues are related to any of these major factors. Interventions are different because you can see that although we have relatively little mention of digital learning as a factor in either context, 10% of the interventions were to do something using digital learning. And that seems reasonable because Digital learning ought to be an area of strength for teachers to improve deficits and to address issues. And we also have the axiom that um, children from more impoverished areas have a lack of access to digital equipment and therefore that the school is a place where that can be addressed. However, both of us having ICT backgrounds in both cases were a little bit concerned that there was so little mention of digital learning. Um, you'll notice specific needs. One, EC, one postgraduate student in five decided, having decided that whatever the issue was that was causing them concern, that they would end up carrying out an intervention with one to four young people. And that's quite a significant impact, given that the, the mention of the need is much smaller. Let's move on to the next slide and look at the middle of the table. Uh, we've deliberately put the, the heavy academic issues, if you like, here, but also with the role of parents and the role of the child themselves in the learning. So we have attainment in literacy and numeracy. We have literacy itself, numeracy itself, parental engagement with the learning process and the behavior of the child during the learning process. Uh, suddenly we see that this does not appear, parental engagement 
was not an issue within the catchment. So only one teacher in the postgraduate context and nobody else perceived that parental engagement was a major problem for their school. However, by the time they get down to the learning and, and teaching process, it becomes a bigger issue. Um, attainment is roughly split two to one towards numeracy. The attainment issues are twice as common in numeracy as they are in literacy. So if I actually add up the, um, the various numbers that are hiding behind this, what we discover is about 42% of the early career teachers and 14% of the postgraduates saw literacy either in the learning or the attainment context as the major learning problem in their class. Roughly 25% of ECTs and about 15% of PGTs saw either learning or attainment in numeracy as a learning problem in their class. Um, it's interesting to look at the, we cannot name the local authorities because we have some of the data and confidence, but looking at the local authorities involved in this study, um, their data suggests that the, the problem that needs to be addressed is not the literacy that most people move towards, but the problem is numeracy. And that, that tends to reflect how the teachers themselves saw it in terms of the learning and teaching issues, but not in terms of learning and teaching um, activities. Interestingly, however, half of the ECTs decided to carry out an intervention in literacy, although less than a third of them had actually felt it was a problem. Only 6% of postgraduates decided that literacy was an issue that needed to be dealt with. Numeracy, the numbers are far less even though the incidence of numeracy problems, was, numeracy problems was twice as high as it was of literacy. Behaviour issues were thin on the ground and parental engagement issues were quite significant in postgraduate contexts and yet there was no follow through with a specific intervention. Let's look at the third table. These are highlighted in pink, um, mainly because we have concerns about uh, the ones that are highlighted in pink. We see the remaining um, quarter of PGT students identified learning issues, 6% pedagogy, 9% developing the young workforce, 6% transitions and so on down. The ECT learning and teaching issues are a glob of 14% and they are a glob quite deliberately because they were fairly random things that were quite specific to the class of that teacher and did not fit with any of the major factors above. So we just parked those there. Societal encatchment issues don't really occur down here for early career teachers, but postgraduates, um, secondary uh, students by and large were concerned both with DYW and transitions. But if I move to interventions, there has been almost no mention of health and well-being at all so far. And whilst we suspect that in some cases, given the write-up that the students gave us and the explanation that the students gave us, that HWB is a response to some of the big societal factors in the top left. It is quite stark to see 17% of the early career teachers and 29% of the postgraduates carrying out uh, an intervention related to health and well-being. And we're, we're not talking about inviting parents in uh, to do something because parents are not supportive of learning. Uh, you've seen that already and there was no sign of such interventions at all. We're talking about something specifically related to HWB as a subject. And the other factor that really interested us was sort of broad stream pedagogy. Um, quite a few students wanted to write a policy that they themselves might not be the ones to implement, but they felt it would be useful for their school. Uh, and that seemed to be equally balanced in both early career teachers and postgraduates. Developing the young workforce attracted a little attention but not much action. Leadership did not appear at all. It, it's fascinating that we spend so much time talking about leadership of learning, and yet there was effectively no leadership intervention, just one. Uh, play appeared from left field in, in a very specific context in one school. And despite all that has gone on in the secondary curriculum, and we had a fair number of secondary teachers, there's only 3% of postgrads who felt the curriculum itself was an issue. So the accessibility of the curriculum, the structure of the curriculum, the way in which students can combine subjects, all of that did not occur. 
and yet there were suddenly there were 9% of interventions in PGs at the end. If I move on to the final slide, Derek, I'll pick up our questions there. Thanks. Um, I, I'll, we've got quite a long list of them, so I'll, I'll summarize them in a different way. Um, probably five things occurred to us that, that are most significant and which we are continuing to explore. The student's choice of interventions is a complex process. We obviously have 100 students worth of data of how they worked their way through that. And we're very interested in whether or not A, being involved in an academic process as well as a learning process is significant. B, whether they are more affected by external factors than by the actual data that they acquired. And then there are issues that tend to cut across that. Their ability to manipulate data was quite different in many cases. And Stephen has already done that in depth. So I'm just gonna pass over that. Why numeracy appears not to be supported by any, a significant extent of intervention is something that causes us some concern. One of the authorities in particular has a massive problem with numeracy, and yet its students, all but one, failed to address numeracy in any way. And, and that seemed to be completely at right angles to what we should see. Why health and well-being appears to be a topic of significant apparent over-intervention and then finally, the extent to which various external factors move students perhaps off the course that we think their data might suggest they pursue into a different pathway. And I, I hang a final question about ourselves because we think that we've operated effectively on a range of courses. One of the questions we have to face is, do we need to do further work on these courses? I think that's us. That's great, Jim and Derek. Thanks ever so much for your contribution there. And uh, note that both Stephen and Jim and Derek posed some questions to us more broadly themselves. So if you do want to come in in response to those questions in a moment, we'll invite you to give us a show of digital hands to, to come and speak if you'd like to. And um, there are some questions and comments in the chat to pick up on too. I think one of the questions I was quite uh, intrigued to ask in light of the findings of Dundee there was, in relation to this connection between the two parts of the project that the, the students are working on in, in or the practitioners are working on between them doing this contextual search to find out what's going on in the community and then the intervention that's responsive to it. And I'm just wondering, especially with the increased focus on health and well-being, if they carried out the first part before the virus outbreak and if the second part was alongside that, or if there, there are any other things you can spot that could be part explanations for this variation in, in the interventions to what you might expect on their early discoveries? We, we can deal with the virus quite easily, uh, and then I'll, I'll let Derek cover other things. Um, all of this data is pre-viral data. Uh, we, we actually started the project very early. We, uh, without going into the details, we acquired some money that allowed us to launch fast. Uh, and so we actually had two years of data built up. Um, some of the subsequent data is affected and we haven't yet brought that into this because we're gonna to have to look at that against the pre-viral data, but it's, it's not a viral issue. Uh, Derek has just disappeared under the table. So, <laughs> oh my goodness. Uh, I'm, I'm gonna go on for that reason. This, this happened once before, as I recall. Um, the wider factors, the courses have actually set up, Mark, so that there isn't a dichotomy, there isn't a gap at all. Um, they do the contextual research and they do an initial project in, in, at each level of, of work, whether it's ITE or ECT or postgrad. They do an initial project to look at the wider factors, and that leads them into a, a project at the end of that module that draws together those factors so they have them ready to move on. I suppose the big question is whether those factors do move on with them or whether the next set of factors that come along in terms of the learning ones, which are carried out at the beginning of the next module, actually are the ones that stick in their heads. And that, that's, uh, I think Derek's gone away so that he doesn't have to answer the question. But um, it's one of the questions that we posed to our ITE colleagues very recently about whether that carryover is actually taking place effectively or whether they're really starting again. And we know teachers are good at starting again in Scotland. That's great, Jim, thanks very much. And Derek has apologized in the, the chat for technical issues, which it looks like you might be overcoming. But there are, there are a couple of questions in the chat, if I could uh, draw those to your attention. The first one's 
asking about um, people on placement, whether they're truly equipped with pupil characteristics. So, or the practitioners in these settings. So do they have gender SIMD, ASN, EAL, FSM data, for example, for their schools in your experience from, from these projects? Any, any student in Scotland can get a lot of data about their schools from the Scottish Government um, Tableau website. There's lots and lots of data there. It tells you everything from SIMD, the number of pupils in the school, female, male breakdown, their literacy, numeracy uh, score, you name it, they can get it. It tells them everything. English is a second language. It's all there. They just need to know where to find it. And I direct my students to that. Every student gets directed to that. Uh, do you want to talk about the ITEs? And I'll talk about the ECTs and PGTs after that. <laughs> no, he doesn't. Oh, can't hear you. That's that's the thing, Derek, at the minute. You, you may be aware. Right, I'll, I'll, I'll leave the ITEs hanging in case Derek's sound suddenly comes back. But I'll talk about the, P, the PGTs and, and the ECTs. Um, we ensure that when they go out to their schools, that they're aware that there is a rich data environment there, that they should, as a member of staff, have access to it. But one of the things we found out, and perhaps the reason for the question, is that there is significant variation across schools. I don't know if Stephen, yeah, Stephen's nodding as well. There is significant variation across schools in terms of the volume and nature, and, and dare I say, quality of data that's available to the classroom teacher. And, and obviously, if you're a student teacher just in the door, there is a harder job there. We can point them in that direction, but we can't necessarily ensure that they get the data that they need. We obviously try to help them, our tutors, are primed and everybody else's tutors likewise will be primed to make sure that they go with what we can give them and that they also go and get what's available to them immediately in the school. But there seem to be different local authority and school policies with respect to how much data is shared and how the sharing takes place. Can you hear me? Yeah. Oh, thank goodness. Uh, sorry, folks, I've been having problems with a sound card on my machine. Uh, about ITE. We have, uh, as, as Stephen uh, uh, mentioned earlier, I think, there was this idea of a uh, student getting access to SIMD figures. And when we speak to our students in, in Dundee anyway in our ITE courses, particularly when they're out on placements, we are actively engaging them and in, in, in looking at SIMD figures when they're going out on placements. So that's, these kind of contexts are becoming very much part and parcel of how we explore what it means to, to, to find out about the needs of learning communities when our students go out on placement. We've also got it kind of built into a new module that we've got built into our ITE programme in third year. It's a, an equity specific focus uh, on what we're doing. And so that module, as I, as I understand, it's beginning to bring in a number of these issues that look at also the way in which data can be used to impact on our understanding of a uh, number of issues that are related to children and farms and communities in relation to e equity issues. I think related to these questions too, and uh, I recall having a glimpse at a reading from 2016 by, by Dover and others who talked about a distinction between a, a justice oriented approach and a more accountability driven approach. So, so the justice driven obviously focusing more on the holistic child and their needs and the social justice issues related to that versus what the data driven sort of accountability model tends to generate. And I'm just wondering if in your experience, um, the students or the practitioners access to such data in school can be limited in any sort of sense in terms uh, obviously they can get the overall position for the school but between individual pupils um, and if that seems to play into the these results you're finding here i don't know what you think i think all three of us are looking at each other to see who's going to go first <laughs> Derek, you you've already done a bit on um, justice uh, as part of something that we wrote before. Do you want to say something about that? Uh, is this in relation to our values module? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, in terms of ideas of social justice and what we've done, Mark, in our programme over the past couple of years is that we've really looked at how this can impact on our students developing understanding of these issues that we feel are related to equity, how they impact on children, families and communities. Uh, and we're bringing it up front and central in the minute our students come in the door. 
We have a values module in first year uh, that we have really worked on over the past few years. And we have our social work students, our teacher education students, our community education students working together on this module. And from a teacher education perspective, what we've done is that we've touched on a number of issues such as, uh, for instance, the work of Grasso et al from their paper in 2017 talked about is, is, it child, is it Thatcher's children or Blair's babes? And it looked at this idea that what their research has shown is that we've had, uh, you could argue that teacher education students coming into teacher education programs now uh, are, have been brought up in what you might call a kind of a, a backdrop of a neoliberal economic perspective. And one which maybe has them focusing on issues of poverty and areas of deprivation in a kind of a deficit frame. So what we're attempting to do with that is to really tackle these notions and to uh, meet head on what it means, what poverty means to children and families, what it means for the attainment gap, etc. So these are kind of things that we've started to introduce to our programme on their undergraduate programmes anyway, that hopefully we can build on into our third year equity module and we're actually starting to see this in relation to our fourth year thesis students, where they're starting to touch on issues around equity in their undergraduate programmes. And we have also been building uh, the understanding of um, how you shape your your reflections around about issues of care, social justice, and what to look for and how to think more creatively around about what you can do in the classroom um, pedagogically and how to monitor that and how effective that might be. You know, we're trying to get our students into a frame of reference that actually doesn't see these inequities from that deficit model position, but to actually look at it from assets-based approaches, to think in terms of the, the, the opportunities and the affordances that are available in the classroom to all pupils, and, and not to be almost labeling, oh, you're in an SIND one area, because that, that's, that, that, that brings with it other cognitive biases that actually pigeonhole children and that's the, the very thing that we're really trying to you know stop them from doing because immediately they start trotting out you know but the policy says this ah, but that's a gross generalization and it's about getting them to critically engage with what does it mean to 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 be a socially just teacher in the 21st century it's not about you know applying a, a deficit model. It's about actually thinking about what impact you can have in small ways all the time in the classroom. And it, it's getting them to that, that point where they can actually understand that whilst they are going to be getting lots of pressures on them from lots of different um, areas, such as, you know, inspectors and, you know, results-based approaches, that they actually have to, you know, try and think beyond that model and start to ask some questions around about well how am i how am i contextualizing the learning that makes it meaningful to everybody how am i differentiating so what practices what pedagogies can i then bring to the fore that will will almost fit neatly into the agenda of looking at supporting all learners from where they are rather than from where i think they are that's really helpful, Stephen, and um, it's reflected in some of the comments in the chat too. Um, Paul was mentioning, for instance, you know, maybe there's a need for a care-driven approach rather than either justice or accountability being dominant, and that sort of intimate knowledge of the learners and meeting their needs is very much aligned with that. And I'm thinking also to the experiences of our students within the research we've carried out at the University of the Highlands and Islands. You know, a lot of the, the newly qualified teachers there experiencing very different experiences of the pupils compared to what, for instance, SIMD data shows. So they might be in an area which actually is all right in terms of the SIMD data, but actually they've got severe needs in terms of the learners and actually the local knowledge is exactly what they need to be able to meet those needs. And so actually the, the teacher agency is, is the key important thing there, whether they've got the, the responsibility and ability to, to meet those needs you know, from the classroom and, and equipping themselves with the pedagogies just as you've indicated there, Stephen, that's great. One of the things, um, Mark, I, I've noticed as well from my students uh, on, on, on the postgraduate course as well, is even this afternoon, I was uh, doing a, an assessed virtual visit with a student who's on placement at the moment, and 
she was talking about in her section of her online file that we were talking about earlier, our OneNote online file. And because the way we structure it, well, as we all do, you know, you've got section one of the standard for provisional, for provisional registration. And she was talking really quite explicitly about the, the contrast between the, S, the, the sociodemographic situation of her first placement school and her second one. And she was, she was using the SIMD, SIMD figures as well to help her do that. So I think that this is something that we've really introduced in our, into the Dundee experience anyway over the past few years. And I think I'm starting to see this becoming almost the norm now where our students are looking at these figures and using that to help them inform their understanding of, the, of what it maybe means for children and families in the communities that their, that their placement schools serve. That's really interesting, yeah. Uh, and the, the examples people gave as well were of hierarchies of access to such data. And in some schools, it was just part of the accountability-driven approach. And the first time you'd hear of the pupil being identified this way is in a meeting with a, you know, a, a deputy head or somebody who is going to ask you what's happening to, to meet their needs and isolating that child from the class in that sort of way and, and along the lines of the deficit model. We did get a question earlier on that maybe we could just quickly touch on. Um, it doesn't give us much time for as big a problem it is, but just to reflect David's question from earlier, you know, do we feel it's the school curriculum that's light in statistical literacy that generates the problem that we're, we're facing here, you know, represented in, in the evidence you presented today, an avoidance of numeracy or lack of confidence or competence in it's, it and from a data point of view? There is a bigger issue that's been discussed in our group before in terms of whether literacy, numeracy and HWB predominate to an inappropriate extent in the curriculum. Uh, I actually think to some extent we forget in Scotland that there is a much wider curriculum than the big three. But if you look at the numeracy situation, Stephen said it and I said it as well, even students who have a very strong numeracy background don't necessarily use the data well or use that data to come to a conclusion that addresses the key issue that the students, that the pupils in the class are facing. Um, so yeah, I, I think probably we need to have a, a greater depth of numeracy in students' curricula and perhaps in the school curriculum because we're still having problems. There is a, there is a fairly well-known curve that grows to somewhere in primary four and children are doing really well from their nursery experiences and then they tip over the top and start to go back down the far side. So there's a, there's a pupil issue, but there's also a student teacher issue there. Would you like to come in on it, Stephen? Yeah, one of the things that's really interesting is that I know um, 60, oh, just about 60% of my PGD secondary cohort have a STEM background. And of those that didn't do very well, uh, I, could, I, I, I know that it's to do with their inability to apply their numeracy to the context and actually then to then bridge that numeracy um, and the inferences that come from that to the pedagogical context. And we need to help them to bridge that. It's, it's not that they don't have numeracy skills, it's just that they can't contextualize it and apply it. And that's a real issue because I've seen a number of these student teachers actually doing really, really well in the classroom. But when you see that kind of data, you're thinking, What's happened? It's almost as if they can naturally apply it, but when you actually abstract it and pull them um, to uh, do a task, they have to do a little bit of concentrate. They really, they can't realize and they don't understand. I mean, for for example, that data set that I gave them, that simple question of what does that tell you about the class's attainment? Two things that should have immediately said just by looking at the standard deviation and the mean is it's a mixed ability class. And the number of them that couldn't tell me that is shocking across the board. So it, sometimes it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a numeracy thing, but sometimes it's just actually they, they feel to contextualize it within their own thinking about practice. That leaves us, sorry. sorry. Oh, I was just going to say, Jim, we're very much uh, on the cusp of time uh, at the moment, but uh, it's a question that we can't really answer in the, in the, the time space that we, we do have. But just to pick up on a couple of, sort of questions and points in the chat quickly first, one was just asking, I suppose, across both data sets, if there was any difference by gender at all. Um, so maybe an interest in, in, 
if they'd seen that done, result by it? Yeah, I haven't done the I haven't done a, a, a gender analysis. Could because I've got that data, but I've I've not really drilled down to look to see if there's a male, female, and I've got other as well data. Um, so I've, I've not actually done that, but I could do that. Yeah. yeah, we deliberately chose not to do that for this level of analysis because we didn't think that was the factor. Uh, we did analyze it by the, the sector in which the students were operating. So we have data for nursery, primary, secondary, uh, but we didn't do it by gender. It's fair to say, however, that both of our groups are heavily female biased. There's, there's a couple I have of to comments. Say that's the same for mine as well. Right, okay, yeah. We've got a couple of comments maybe just on which to end. So Nicola was commenting that uh, she very much agreed with the comments about moving from a deficit model to the asset model. So some reinforcement of the, the points that were made there. And also Paul sort of saying that uh, perhaps to some extent we're um, focusing a little bit too much on the data-driven stuff. Um, and, and maybe we need to move beyond the data and live with people instead. So get to that uh, situation where we're thinking about the lived experience rather than what the statistics show. Um, lots of stuff for us to go and reflect on after today. But uh, just to say a huge thank you to everybody who's come along. Uh, we really appreciate you, you being here, sparing your time to join us and also for the useful comments and questions in the chat. So just as mentioned previously, um, do please look out for the other events that are coming up. So um, as we say, we've got the spring fling in terms of CIRA Connect. So there are a number of events for you to be able to join in there. If you go to the CIRA.ac.uk um, webpage, you'll be able to see the link to, to see what's coming up. And uh, just to remind you of the benefits of CIRA membership as well. So thank you ever so much, much appreciated. Thank you, Mark, um, a great session. Um, from uh, from yourselves, we really enjoyed it and looking forward to the future ones. So, and thank you everybody for attending and stimulating and interesting conversation on the chat and beyond as ever. Thank you, folks. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you.